Okay. Well, um, right. thank you so much for sticking around after the film. As as you can see, we have an extraordinary group of people here, and um, we'll be talking to people all over the world from all the different uh, input valves to this conversation. So if you are not already following How to Survive a Plague on Twitter, um, it would be a great thing for you to do right now. So if anyone's got their phones here or out there in the world, follow Survive a Plague on Twitter, because um, we're going to be doing some actions tonight that will require you to be on Twitter. So. And on Google Plus. And also the hashtag for everyone here and everyone out in the world is survive a plague. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. So um, you've just seen an extraordinary film and an extraordinary example of how activism has changed the world. And it changed the world for AIDS. But this film is a really, really great playbook for how to change the world in general. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about AIDS or poverty or conflict diamonds. This is a universal playbook. So what we're going to do tonight is talk broadly about the lessons from this film and how they can be changed, how they can be used to change the world in lots of different ways. Um, so I think before we get started, I also want to just mention that there's going to be, there'll be lots of different people in the audience who will stand up and ask questions. And there are mics here and here. So if you have a question in the live audience, please join us there. So. Um, You've all been introduced. You are all extraordinary people. Um, but I'm going to give a little bit more background. Angelique is a Grammy award-winning artist who has fought AIDS for a long, long time. And she is also an ambassador for UNICEF and for Act 5, Band of AIDS. She's an incredible woman, as you know. Um, and she has been at the forefront of this fight for many, many years. David, New York Times best-selling author, journalist and the award-winning filmmaker. Do you want to talk about your awards? This is so exciting. <laughs> Can we just announce? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So the film has recently won. Um, well, uh, it, uh, last week it won the Gotham Award for Best Documentary. Um, thank you. Uh, and uh, today it won, um, what's the formal name of the award today? New York Film Critics Circle Award for Best New Film uh, by a first-time filmmaker. Yay! It's the first time a documentary has won in that category. It's true, it's true. Um, and uh, just about two hours ago, they announced the shortlist for documentaries for the Academy Award, and it's on the shortlist. Yay! So, Anybody in this audience, anybody in the world who knows on anyone on the Oscar judging panel, now would be the time to call them. So, um, Peter Staley really needs no introduction. One of the most legendary AIDS activists of all time. A man to whom I am personally grateful for saving my life. Um, but also a man who started AIDSmeds.com and who served on Clinton's task force uh, for drug development and was an AMFAR board member. AMFAR looked and is still looking for the cure. So an extraordinary career in your life as well. And we have a young woman today with us, Amira Sakara, who is just an amazing, amazing young woman who I've met recently and had the pleasure of working with many times. Um, student Global AIDS Campaign. Universities across the nation um, advocating for lots of social change, but focused on HIV AIDS. And um, had the pleasure of having you in my office a couple years ago to talk about your work. So became an AIDS activist at 14 when she went to visit her grandparents in Malawi, right? Yeah. Yeah, so started early, is young, but already a pro. So I look forward to your conversations today. Um, why don't we take the first question, and Peter, if I may direct it at you. It's coming from the outside world. Um, and I don't know if it's, does it show up on a screen, or do we have a way to communicate it? This is my first time doing a Google Hangouts. So we'll figure this out together. Um, I know what the question is, though. So the question is, how can young people today take the lessons from ACT UP and TAG and apply them to the modern, movements to fighting conflict-free stones, to fighting fighting for that, you know, global warming, gender violence. Like what how universal are the lessons of this film and how can they be applied in the modern world? Well, um, there's there's one underlying thing and and that was uh, persistence. Um, it, I, I think it's very hard to to take uh, specific techniques from any one movement and apply them uh, in a contemporary setting. Because the media is reacting differently to things now than they were then. Uh, the targets might be different depending on the movement. 
So uh, we, we large, I mean, we borrowed a lot from previous movements, and you should do that. We, we borrowed from the women's movement and the early gay rights movement, post-Stonewall movement. Um, and, uh, but we, we, most of the playbook we made up on our own. Uh, and you have to do that uh, for each movement and each moment in time. But the underlying ingredient is persistence and just keeping at it. Um, and as you saw in this film, uh, that's a 10-year span. Uh, nothing happened really fast. And it was an emotional roller coaster. Hmm. And uh, for, the, for the bulk of it, we were very, very pessimistic about our, our odds at succeeding. Um, and so uh, if, if you're an activist now and you're like, oh, how can I do this and how can I see the end? Uh, we, you know, we rarely thought we'd see the end. Um, and uh, we still haven't seen the end. The AIDS crisis isn't over. But um, persistence and just sticking at it really, really pays off. Um, and it's a long, it can, activism can be a long game. Um, so surround yourself uh, with, with uh, supportive people and make a family of it and use some dark humor to keep you going uh, like we did. And uh, uh, there, I see a lot of activism today that I find very inspiring. And it doesn't use the exact techniques of ACT UP, but uh, um, they're going to have an impact. Yeah. So. But never giving up, which is something that you have certainly not done. You have been in this fight a long, long time. How did you get into the fight originally? What motivated you and what caused you to become such an avid activist for AIDS? Well, what first brought my attention to this is the orphans of AIDS in Africa. And also that the pandemic started having the face of African women. And when people start judging other people's choices of life, instead of finding solution to a pandemic, it makes me mad. Because there's no morality when a child is dying or when anyone is dying. Life is beyond morality. Life is beyond politics. Life is beyond everything. And if we cannot fight to save the life of the children, then we cannot call ourselves humankind. And the number of orphans of AIDS in Africa is appalling. And those kids come to life with a stigma that they don't ask for. That is, most of the time, the responsibility of the fathers. Because the women in Africa, you can't tell your man when he comes and say, OK, I'm ready tonight. You don't know where he has been, and you can question him. So therefore, you start seeing women dying, one after the other, and the children dying. And here I am, as an African woman, and as an African mother, I said to myself, what can I do? How can I help to relate, to be the voice of the one that we don't see, that we don't hear? And especially when you have a child, a four-year-old little boy in Tanzania, sat on your lap with so much fever that I can barely touch him, that looked me in the eyes with those eyes shining from fever and tell me, I have a message for the world through you. I said, what is it? He said to me, we children of this world, we should be the priority of every adult. And that is the thing that we lose. Activists for me have no timetable. Because as far as, as you live, you have to fight for your own survival. And you have to fight for the survival of other people. Activism is something that you have to be ready to put your life online for. Because if you don't stand for something, you die for everything. And the young kids today have to learn that if they want a better future, it's not sitting home that's going to make it happen. It's not letting their future in the hand of the politician that's going to make it happen. Be active. Complacence is killing us. Well, it's an incredibly great point. And someone who has taken your words to heart is Amira. And by the way, I'm going to say hello to Lorindo out there in the Philippines. I think it's like 5 o'clock in the morning. But we'll be joined also um, on screen in a minute by, by Lorindo. So talk to me about activism today as a young person advice for peers and social media. Everybody says that they can tweet. We're going to do it here tonight. I'm getting used to it. Um, you know, what has happened and what has changed with social media? What are the good things it's brought to activism and what are the challenges or what is it not able to do that could happen in an ACT UP meeting back in the 80s? Yeah, so I'm, I'm of the social media generation. 
Um, 22, and so I grew up with Facebook, and my whole life is on the internet. Um, and on the one hand, <laughs> on the one hand, uh, social media does something really good for us. Um, as an organizer, it does something very good, which is that you can click a few buttons and reach thousands or millions of people. So you can get millions of signatures very easily on a petition. You can do a tweeting campaign, and a politician will notice that he's getting or sh she's getting, you know, however many thousands of, of tweets about the same issue. But there is a complacency that has developed in our generation, I think, when it comes to activism via social media. There is nothing that replaces thousands of bodies in streets. Mm -hmm. There is an inherent power in using your body in your activism, when you're willing to lay yourself, your own body, on the line in an act of civil disobedience, that sends a message. And that's what our generation is missing. And I also think it's one of the great things about the AIDS movement today, is we still continue in the legacy of, of ACT UP, of Peter and of Mark, civil disobedience, laying our bodies on the line use that power that we have. We need the social media, we need the thousands or millions of tweets that's important today to build our movement, but don't stop there. If you want to change, you need to lay your body on the line, you need to talk directly to your politicians the way that Bob Rafsky heckled President Clinton. You need to do that because that's what sends a message. So we're gonna take a time out for our quick uh, first action to speak to the president and to the appropriators who are going to decide right now on the budgets for the entire country, but in them, the budgets for what happens to AIDS domestically and globally. So if you go to, at Survive a Plague, in their Twitter feed is a tweet that begins at President Obama. So please go there now and retweet that tweet. And that tweet is all written for you. All you have to do is retweet it. So we'd appreciate that. Media. So. It plays an enormous role in activism, and you have used, I think, just about every form of it now that you've done the film. Um, talk to me a little bit about what it's been like for you as uh, an author and a journalist who followed the movement, was in the movement, um, you know, embedded basically for years and years and years. And how does that time compare to this time, being on the road with the film and what you're seeing and feeling out there today? Uh, well, it's. Um, it I, I wouldn't necessarily call myself embedded back then. I was a person who, um, like everybody in the community, had um, you know a, a dog in the fight. I wanted to live. You know, we all wanted to live, and um, I was not HIV positive, but so many people I knew were, and I felt that there was a, a responsibility to. I think we all felt a responsibility then to do something, to do what we could do, and and I developed my journalism career. Uh, in response to that, as a way to see if I could find, you know, that those scraps of information that might uh, uh, help produce, you know, some hope or some avenue for people uh, to pursue if they if they if they couldn't find any on their own. It was the days before social media. You 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 couldn't Google information. Mm -hmm. uh, it was you didn't know who was re uh, researching what drugs, and so I I took that job on myself, and uh, and and that was a form of activism, but it was journalism. Mm -hmm. It was principally journalism about asking questions and getting answers, and um, and and what I've done with the film was to take uh, instead of the opportunity to look back at those years and try to see if um, if you could if if I could learn uh, deeper lessons from from that time. And the first thing, of course, that I discovered was that, no, that so few people knew the, the, the truth of what happened then, and that somehow this little massive piece of history had, had vanished, had kind of dissipated to the point where people under the age of 40 had very little idea of the kind of work that you were doing and, and several of the people here in, in this room were doing um, back then. And mm -hmm. um, it's, just, it's been a, a, an eye-opening experience to find out how much that um, the transmission of that history got broken. And, um, and so in a way, just bringing that story back is a form of activism. Has the film helped put this back on the radar, do you feel? Well, I think it has. Certainly, I think what we've noticed in the last six months is that AIDS is climbing back onto the radar screen. It's trending. Mm -hmm. AIDS is trending. And, um, 
And, uh, and I think that might be in part because uh, the people are, uh, especially people who didn't live through this time, are, are hearing these stories and seeing these stories for the first time and connecting with them and connecting with the idea that these were very young people who were given no permission by anybody to, to revolutionize healthcare in America, and yet they did it anyway. Mm -hmm. We saw an amazing action this week with uh, ACT UP New York uh, and uh, Amara's group, uh, SGAC, uh, in Washington, stripping naked uh, in, uh, in Majority Leader Boehner's office. Uh, put <laughs> Definitely watch got, the video. Uh, we got the New York <laughs> Times. Uh, USA Today. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, pushing, pushing for a, uh, a Robin Hood tax, a financial transaction tax that would raise $350 billion a year and, and help, uh, and some of that money could be put to ending this AIDS crisis because we, we now have the tools to do it. Mm -hmm. right. um, so yeah, and it was. There was a, another uh, group of largely youth activists, Queerocracy from New York City, very involved, Act Up Philadelphia, Act Up New York, Student Global AIDS Campaign, Health Gap. Uh, so it's, it's awesome. Right, well it's interesting, you know, do you point that out how, um, a lot of young gay people are coming back and joining the, the AIDS movement again. I mean, you saw a trend where I think, you know, obviously the gay movement in America let, took on the mantle of AIDS from the very beginning. But then I noticed actually in my first years of pause it, it, it being slightly different. And now I'm so pleased to see a lot of LGBT, LGBT groups coming back. Um, and actually, let's go to Lorindo. I think um, he's actually in Bangkok. And do we know if he's um, online? Can we go there? Um, so the question I wanted to ask Lorindo is, you are not only an openly HIV positive man, but an openly gay man, and have made a point of fighting the stigma of both uh, the disease and your sexual orientation, and, and have encountered, hello, and have encountered some challenges. Uh, so talk to us about the, the, the work that you do and um, how you overcome uh, your fears and how you've been so brave and, and the impact that you've made. Uh, uh, thanks. Thanks very much for this opportunity. Uh, to, to join you all. Um, it, 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 to be honest, it, it, it's still increasingly difficult for people to be speaking about sexuality in the Asia Pacific region. Um, I, I was speaking to many advocates at a workshop from four countries uh, just uh, this last month, and we were talking about the number of people who are willing to speak about their HIV positive status publicly, as opposed to the number of people willing to speak about their sexuality publicly. And what I found interesting is that we're seeing a very slow but, but promising trend that people are willing to be talking about their status, and yet still not being willing to say that they are gay or they're transgender or they may be of another sexual minority. And I think that that is a major challenge that we have to face in countries, not only in Asia, but in other non-Western countries, where it's difficult to talk about sex. Oh, boy. Um, so so I, I think that uh, that realization has really you know, emboldened me even further. To, to try and see how far I can push the limits and encourage people in my own social networks to push the limits as well. Uh, but we'll need to find different tactics and strategies because the culture of aggressive uh, advocacy uh, that we had seen from the from ACT UP and what had, you had seen in How to Survive a Play um, would, would in some cases would be quite challenging in this, in this region. I'm not saying it's impossible. But for these movements to be effective, we need critical mass. And so I, I think we need to be more creative and innovative and find ways where we can still push the envelope, but also uh, make people feel empowered at the same time. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, Welcome back to you. Do you want to comment? Well, what he said resonated so much in me right now because here we are talking about what ACT UP um, have done, which is a great, great, great and amazing work. But that work doesn't hit Africa. You see, today if you stand up in Africa and you say you're homosexual, you are in concert, certain country like Uganda, you can be sent to death. And it was not like that before the, the religious group from America arrived in most of the country in Africa. And they are the one basically telling the government to implement 
in the law to pass into law that if you are homosexual, you are a pedophile, therefore you have to go to jail or to be put to death. So what is going on right now is that we have two words working side by side. In Asia, it's not easy to talk about your status. It's not easy to talk about the fact that you are homosexual or not, or transgender or whatever it is. In Africa, it's even worse. So we have, right now, we don't have enough uh, statistic about the, the, the um, um, homosexual s uh, societies in Africa. We don't know how many of them. Everybody has to hide. I know I, when I was going to school, I was friends with many people. I mean, I have a lot of friends that were homosexual. They will not, nobody will let them in their home but my parents. And I want to grow up with that without understanding why it was so dangerous. But my mom and dad say, it does not matter. Before anything, they are human beings. Their right to live depends on no one. And the, the thing also that we have to put in perspective here is religion that in certain part of the world plays so much role in restraining people to talk out. And HIV AIDS have such a link with something that is really intimate. That's, the, that's where life begins. And at the same time, it's a place where you have the stigma of shame. Mm -hmm. How can pleasure become shameful if it's not because of religion? And here we are, we can do as much as we want. We can talk as much as we want if we do not push the religion people out of this discussion or for them to, be, to sit down here and tell us it's okay to be homosexual. We, we, we will lose because they have the power to stop us at any cost. And it's just hypocrisy because among them, there are a lot of gay people to come out, be part of the civil society, just saying, man. Just saying. All right. So to this point, I think we actually, I'm going to take a question from the audience, and I believe we have a friend of mine here. I'm looking out to uh, Fortunata. Will you, will you go to the mic? Um, Fortunata is actually from Africa. And Fortunata, do you want to tell a little bit about your story and ask yes. a question? Yes. Um, hi, everybody. I moved down to U.S. in 97 uh, from Tanzania for a different reason. I was starting my new life, and I was coming to school. But I was pregnant. I was a few months pregnant, and that's when I was diagnosed with HIV. It was such a surprise, but I, I just happened to be in the right country at that time. Because, <laughs> Peter, what you guys spent years fighting, that little pill, that AZT, prevented me from passing the disease to my kid. I was horrified. I was so scared that my baby is going to die. I was horrified I was going to die. I didn't want to die. But this is the proof right here. My daughter, Florida, she's 15 years old right now in high school. She's living because of that medicine that prevented her to get it. Now, what I say is it works. The pills works. Now, there's not enough information out there. There's a lot of people that I meet that still don't know that it's possible. Um, and I think as much, I fight for everything. I, you know, I advocate for everybody. You know, I don't like stigma, you know. So one of the things that I would like to see in my lifetime is that we end HIV and AIDS in babies, in children. I'm lucky, but there's million millions of mothers who are not as lucky as I am. I'm enjoying to be a mother to this beautiful, smart kid, and she's going to be somebody, you know? So um, I don't know. What do you think? What do you guys think about that part um, of activism? I'm here, and I'm spending every day. You know, we go around. We are proud ambassadors for Elizabeth Glazer, who is doing uh, the organization is doing a great job saving babies' lives. But um, Again, this fight is so broad, and we are all in it together until it ends. Thank you. Thank you. So your question is really, what can we do today to help more people realize that you can take medicine to stop Exactly. Now that child. we know it works, we know we can prevent this disease from, I mean, you can imagine how bad it is 
as adults, how much we suffer psychologically and physically. Imagine to the kids, to the babies, to the unborn babies. So we know that it works, that we can prevent it. Um, how much of that um, advocacy, how much of that information, how much of that access is given to the rest of the world, particularly in Africa? I don't even want to talk about my country right now because I know it's, it's still you know, so much work that needs to be done mm -hmm. about that. So Thank you. according to you guys' knowledge, what do you think? Can you talk about something about that? That's an amazing story, and, it, and it, it shows that we actually do have the tools now to save lives. Um, and uh, we just don't have the will and the dollars to finish the job. Mm -hmm. um, Pres uh, uh, Secretary Clinton uh, last week came out with a, a, an international blueprint to end AIDS. Um, to her credit, it is the most uh, scientifically driven plan uh, that's ever been put out by our government. Um, it, it spells out how this actually can be done, how we can end AIDS. Um, the problem is uh, the Obama administration has not uh, put its money where its mouth is. And we need about seven to nine billion dollars more spent internationally every year uh, to actually get the treatments to everybody who needs them and to slowly wind down the epidemic. When people are tested and they're, and they're, and they're offered treatments, they l mostly become non-infectious and you, and you stop, the virus basically stops spreading. Um, so we have the tools now. We just don't have the dollars. We just don't have the international leadership. We're, le we're living in this um, uh, uh, so-called age of austerity, which is really just uh, a gutting of our tax bases uh, 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 for the rich. Um, and we, we're a rich country. We can afford a few billion dollars to end a pandemic that's affected uh, over 30 million people. Uh, and every worldwide. day, $7 billion is spent in, in the war in Iraq. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we can spend that every day, we can find that every year. Yeah. And, and this is a, ch a fact that definitely needs to be checked, but I believe that the United States spends $6 billion a year on cupcakes. So I'm just saying. <laughs> um, that may be, I think someone's like, it's a little, six billion on cupcakes. Someone Google it for me. I've heard this a couple of times. Cupcake? On cupcakes. That gives so, diabetes, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what they want. Um, all right, so we're gonna try to take a video question um, from Anika. Do we have Anika queued up? Hi. Hi. So this this is Anika Erickson Pearson. Did I pronounce that correct correctly? It's actually Annika. Annika, thank you. Okay. So Annika, um, why don't you pose your question to David and we're gonna take the conversation a bit broader. Back okay. to general activism. Absolutely. Well, I'm a student at the University of Colorado Boulder and I'm a volunteer slash advocate with an organization called Results. Um, and my question is, again, just broadening um, this conversation a little bit. So the film offers a model for social change, and how do we use that model to create a movement for ending global poverty, especially when people can't see the problem right in front of them the way they could with the AIDS crisis in New York? Thank you. That's a, that's a very good question and a tough one. Um, thank you, Annika. Um, and I don't know, <laughs> but uh, what, at, because you really have to try it to figure to figure out what the application is. I mean, uh, the what, what uh, and I'm going to really build on what Amira was saying. What uh, what we learned in uh, AIDS activism as the last really great social justice movement of our time was. Um, uh, and which built on previous social justice movements was that people, when they get together, when they when they work together, they they're able to create ideas and synergize their thinking in a way that produces kind of clever solutions to problems, greater uh, answers than they may have uh, found on their own. And and we've seen, I think, in a way that um, that social media has limited that by by giving you the false sense of, of community and interaction, which, um, which is not really a replacement for getting together and talking in public in, with one another in rooms. And, um, and I think the lesson and message we get from, 
from AIDS activism we see in How to Survive a Plague is how over a 10 year period, um, simple ideas became complex ideas. Uh, uh, vague strategy became refined strategy. Failed strategy was abandoned and replaced. And, and all of that with this idea that if, you, uh, if, if your commitment is to the goal, to the end goal, uh, and, and you show up every week no matter what, you, you're likely to find the way to get there. Well, but, but, can, I, can I interrupt you one second about that? Fighting AIDS is a disease, and we know that if our research done, we can find a drug, which we find AZT. But fighting poverty is a different story. Because fighting poverty means you're fighting the system in which we are living in, where there are people that create disease for them to be able to sell the drugs in different ways. Poverty in Africa is not the African people that decided to be poor. It has been decided in the 50s when the independence started in Africa. When the people, the colonizer left, they realized that if they don't keep Africa under poverty, they cannot develop their own society. You have example today of the complacence that we are talking about. We don't react because we think Africa is so far and the poverty is gonna stay there. The poverty is coming here because the, the recipe they use to keep us under poverty, they are using it here. Divide to conquer exists here. In our constitution, they say, the first amendment is our freedom of speech. And I saw on that film that when you start taking your protest and your demand on the street, the first person you face are the police. Why? The police have more right to stop you for talking or they have to be on your side and put the, 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 the people in, 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 in place in charge of uh, the responsibility. So poverty in Africa, it becomes a weapon for the rich country and the leaders that are in place. Every single African leaders that have stood against that purpose have been assassinated and they've done it together. I cannot, because America is out of it, France is in it, in Great Britain, all the countries that have interest in Africa are in it. Today, the example of how we can stop women's rape in the Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, just if we stop that, we will stop poverty. Why? The curtain that is in every computer, you find them there. And so how do we stop it? If we, as a civil society here, we don't start putting pressure on all those companies that use to buy the cotton, the, I mean, the price they want, and give it to the armed force, those people that are raping the women, it's not the army. They are people that are poor that want to make a living out of it. Every woman in Africa today is in danger because they have access to weapons. So we, it's, a, it's, it's a very, very interesting question. We have to find a way as a civil society and use the social media to interact with one another, not to cut Africa out of the problem of Americans and make them part of the problem that, I mean, the fight that we're fighting here and be part of the fight. And if we have that coalition, I'm telling you, every government, every time we stick our head up, they go, uh oh. That's what they're gonna do. <laughs> That's the, point. the point is numbers. Yeah. The, the point is uh, lockstep. Absolutely. The point is working together and, and, and finding ways to keep yeah. your organization, your coalition from splintering. A bit splintering is the, the, the tool that they use to counter it. Absolutely. And, uh, and in each instance, and we saw, for example, in the so-called Arab Spring, we saw um, how that could work. Mm -hmm. um, we, we saw how it could work to make radical change. Uh, but not yet how to institutionalize that radical change. And that's, one hopes, the next stage in that, yes, as long as they hold together. Well, sorry, Rihanna. Okay. Let's not forget that, that in fighting AIDS, if we want to end AIDS, we are talking about changing systems. Because we can't end AIDS if we don't have housing for people living with AIDS. Mm -hmm. And we can't end AIDS if people are too poor to eat regularly so that their meds work. And we can't end AIDS if people have structures where they can take their meds every day at the time they need. So in fighting AIDS, where we have to be working on these different issues, and poverty is something, Anika, I'd really encourage you to look into something like the Robin Hood tax. You know, yeah. where we need more money being funneled into de developing nations. AIDS activists are working on the Robin Hood tax. Nurses are working on the Robin Hood tax. Labor unions are working on it. Poverty activists are working on it. We all need to be 
finding these ways because all of these issues are so interconnected mm -hmm. and if we mm -hmm. want to solve any of them we got to solve all of them right so thank you and I want to take another question from the the Twitter feed um, it's for Peter actually and to your point it's about violence how did you overcome the fear when pulling off the actions that you did um, this person says that they're afraid of arrest and brutality how did you deal with that inside of yourself when you were doing the things that you did well uh we did a lot of planning within, I mean, we, we borrowed from other movements. We, we learned to, to use, uh, uh, to actually practice for demonstrations. We, we had activists whose sole job at demonstrations was to be a go-between between, between uh, those getting arrested and the police. Uh, uh, so the act, it, we make sure as many video cameras were there as possible, which is, doesn't seem to be a problem these days. Um, <laughs> but back then it was a challenge and, and uh, thank God there were some or you wouldn't have seen this film. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, having, having that structure and having pro bono lawyers and uh, having all of that planning uh, gave a lot of us uh, a, a self of, a, 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 a feeling of safety as we, as we laid, laid our bodies down. Um, and, and frankly, uh, the cops were a little more scared of us. Uh, and <laughs> that played to our been. advantage. Um, uh, we, we were dealt with with kitchen rubber gloves at early actions. And uh, uh, so the stigma almost played to our advantage in that sense. But um, uh, I personally, I, was, I, I never felt much fear during those actions. I felt very well taken care of. And I just found it exhilarating. And anybody who has that fear, just just try to go to a large one first, and and go to the planning sessions first. Once you get past it, you'll find it's exhilarating. Um, it's fun breaking the law. It <laughs> really is. Um, and how many times have you been arrested? Only ten. Okay. I'm a wow. I know what you're I'm talking a, about. <laughs> I'm a piker compared to some others, uh, oh, wow. but they were, you know, it was. They were amer amazing experiences. Um, uh, I, it's a surreal part of my my life and everybody who participated in it to watch a community uh, come together like that, that had been uh, so beaten down and, and was being s so stigmatized and ignored by the powers that be, uh, and to rise up like that and to fight back um, and, and, and to find its voice uh, just was a beautiful thing, and uh, I, I feel humbled to have witnessed it and been a part of it, um, uh, and I hope uh, others can experience uh, that thrill as well. Well, um, we're getting towards the end of our time here, but I just wanted to say that for everyone in the audience, for everyone out there in cyberspace, um, go to the How to Survive a Plague website. There's an amazing guide that you can all read to learn how to get involved. There are lots of links to all of the organizations in the Learn, Fight, Love Alliance, which is a great list of organizations working today that people can participate in. Um, and you know, on the Twitter feed currently, there are a couple more tweets out there that are really great. So if you guys would also all go to um, how to survive and uh, retweet all of that and retweet them a whole lot because the more they go out there the best the better and then of course you know as you all have said it's a combination of your communal collective voice and your body in the street at the meetings um, really quickly um, Lorindo I want to thank you for uh, being up very very early with us um, and for being so brave and risking all that you do. Um, I think that that's an element of what we've seen in this film. There is still, there are so many places in the world where people risk their lives to fight for causes and, and that is certainly to be appreciated. Um, Angelique, thank you for the work that you have done. A great way to support celebrities who support movements is to buy their work, so um, that's a very good thing to do. Join the Student Global AIDS Campaign. They rock. Start a, uh, a chapter at your school. Um, you know, really get your kids involved. This is just the next generation. If you go to the website <laughs> right now, click on the World AIDS Week Campaign Kit, and there is a guide. Call your senator, call your congressman, and set up a meeting. Email me directly. I'll help you through the first one. You would be shocked at what those meetings will do. What's your URL? StudentGlobalAidsCampaign.org. 
Um, and will they have to take their clothes off? Maybe. No. <laughs> no. Right. But if you want to feel cool, you can take your clothes off and then make the call naked, you know, for oh. home or something. But. No. Uh-uh, I'll go, but I'm not getting naked. <laughs> I'm an activist, but a na not the naked one. Uh -uh. <laughs> For the record, I didn't do it, so. Oh, you see, you telling people to get naked, you don't do it. Huh. One of the tweets on the, uh, on the, the feed is to call for the Presidential Medal of Freedom for ACT UP. So um, for the people who were there, uh, who fought for so many of our lives, I absolutely would love everyone to go and endorse that. David, thank you for making this incredible film that is so powerful, that is put we're back on the radar. You're, uh, yeah, um, and I was just going to say that uh, what we started back in the early 80s is about to begin to be finished. Um, you are the ambassador for both UNICEF and Act 5. You were just saying Act 5 is a new advocacy organization called The End of AIDS. And it's an amazing one that refers to the final act of Shakespearean drama. It's when we bring the curtain down on AIDS. Um, Peter, thank you for saving my life and so many millions of people's lives. And it is the very least that we can do, those of us who have survived because of your work, to keep fighting for those of those people who are still needing care and treatment around the world, who need to know their status. And let's go get the money, people. Let's get, as you said, let's get the US government and governments around the world, because it's not just up to the United States to end this pandemic. And while we're at it, let's solve a few other things. You know? The United States is the country that is giving the most money. It so is. we have to pull through the Robin Hood tax everywhere, all the way to Europe, all the way to the country that have the money, get them to give us the money. And, and this tax, for those that don't know, it's called the financial transaction tax. In the, in the US, Absolutely. it's the Robin Hood tax. It, it ta taxes financial trans transactions on a minuscule level, but would create billions of dollars of income to give to global health. The Global Fund has a new head. The World Bank has a new head. We've got the tools. We've got the knowledge. We can do this. The advocacy is the thing that will push it over the edge, as you saw in this amazing film. Thank you, Peter, so yes, much. For everything. Thank you, Peter. All right. <laughs> I just wanted to point out that in, in addition to Peter, there are several people here from the film, from ACT UP, from those old days. Uh, Jim Igo, who is here. You know him from the film. An exceptional Jim, AIDS treatment activist. Jim, come up on stage. Mark Harrington in the back of the room. Still uh, active every day in AIDS activism. And, and one other person, Zoe, Zoe Leonard is here. And she's one of the people who used a, a video camera and a film camera to document so much of the work that went on then. And if it weren't for her and the, and the activists who were artists and chroniclers of that time, we, we might have lost all of the de details and these incredible narratives. So Zoe, thank you for coming and thank you for the work you do too. Second floor, uh, in the corner office on 9th Avenue and 15th, was ACT UP's first office. You own it.